responsibility, Tim Brooks. Unilever Chief Sustainable Officer, Mark Kaplan. Plastic Pol uh, Pollution Coalition co-founder, Diana Cohen. And finally, actress and activist, Rosaria Dawson. Thank you so very much for joining us. Spread Take out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's our order. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the last session before lunch. Uh, so I, well, I certainly hope that it will whet your appetites, uh, but that you won't leave early. So um, today we're going to be talking about a very big and possibly somewhat under appreciate the global problem, and that is, that is the problem of plastics. Um, I'm not sure how many of you remember, there's a wonderful film which was released exactly 50 years ago, it's called The Graduate. Uh, one of the most famous lines in that film, uh, when uh, one of the actors is, addresses the character played by uh, Dustin Hoffman, says, I have one word for you, Benjamin. What is that word? It was plastics. 50 years on, um, and five billion tons later, uh, the, the word, the, sort of the, the future encapsulated in the word plastics has become somewhat mo more dystopian um, and, uh, and a huge environmental problem. And today we have a very exciting panel and hopefully we'll uh, see what can be done to tackle this problem. We have with us uh, Rosario Dawson, whom you all probably know as a, as a wonderful actress, but she's also an activist uh, in this area. Uh, we have Diane Cohen, who uh, is the CEO and co-founder of, uh, uh, of the Plastic Pollution Coalition, which is a, uh, a, an organization of um, 650 uh, groups, organizations, companies, and individuals uh, trying to address the, the huge problem of, of plastic pollution. Uh, we have Mark Kaplan, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever, who's basically in charge of making sure that this huge consumer goods company is, uh, is doing as little polluting as possible into the future. And we have, uh, and we have uh, Tim Brooks, who does a very similar job at Lego. Uh, so, you know, from, we, have, we have people from representing the corporate sector, we have, we have activists, and hopefully we'll get some answers. So I, will let, I would like to begin by giving each of them um, a couple of minutes to basically set out their stalls um, and why don't we start with Rosario? Um, just so excited to be here. Thank you very much. Um, the conversations that are here are really important, um, not just to have in this room, though, and to kind of continue to push forward. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity um, to talk about plastics and the realities around them. And we hear we can tech our way out, we can recycle our way out, we can reuse our way out. Um, we're starting to change the conversation from a cradle to grave, to cradle to cradle, and we're trying to be really innovative about that. Um, but I'm excited that we're gonna have the opportunity to really kind of get into the details about what's really working, what's not working, and what we can all be doing to transform our relationship to our planet so we can stop um, killing ourselves and killing it um, and uh, have a more humane kind of experience that still allows us to enjoy our comforts. Leanne? So, I'm excited to be here as well, and I think that this is such a great opportunity at Web Summit to really challenge companies who are here and who, people who are creating technology and innovation to look at ways that we can address plastic pollution upstream and at the front end, and not just as something that we need to clean up. I think that's a very important way to look at this. It's a valuable material. But when we use it and we design things with it, which are meant to be designed with intended obsolescence or for a single or disposable use, we are using a valuable material in a highly irresponsible way. And it's become clear at this point through reports and research that we have plastics, our oceans are full of plastic, that we have microfibers and microplastics in our beauty supplies and in our water supplies around the world, and not just in public and municipal water, but also in bottled water as well. So bottled water is not necessarily the solution, but I think that this is a, it's a real opportunity for us to look at the whole system and think about ways from the get-go, from the front end, from the beginning of design and technology, we can create a truly more sustainable world where we are using plastic and variants of plastic, potentially non-petroleum-based plastics, 
in a way that is non-toxic, that doesn't impact our health uh, negatively, that doesn't impact animals negatively, the waterways, the ocean, or our environment. So that is my challenge, and I'm excited to be here and talk with you guys. Thank you. Mark? Hi. Um, so just to clear up, I lead technology for the Chief Sustainability Office. I am not the Chief I'm Sustainability so sorry. Officer. It's okay. I was misinformed. Um, yeah, no, it's cool. Um, and today, what I'm going to speak about is as an oceans advocate, actually, in my work outside of Unilever. So a few years ago, I set up a public-private partnership with the U.S. State Department and the GSM Association to create mobile services for more sustainable oceans. That included creating services specifically for fishermen. Um, what we did is we tapped NASA satellite images and we created navigation for them using their mobile phones to be able to navigate to their catch and back. That resulted in a reduction in catch times by around 80%, getting a lot of fuel out of the ocean. And then um, it was the first year that we had been told on record that no one had been lost at sea. So now what we can think about is how can we use that, crowd, that, as a, that network and that capability to crowdsource collection of plastics out of the ocean as a secondary income for fishermen. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my name's Tim and I uh, work for a company that makes toys uh, called Lego. And uh, we make a really durable uh, plastic product called the Lego Brick. Um, and it has been uh, compatible uh, since 1958. So anything you buy on the shelves today uh, is backwards compatible with any brick that has been bought since 1958 onwards. So we think that's unique in, in the world, in, in uh, a modern world with lots of obsolescence. But also our biggest contribution, we feel, is to inspire children to learn through creative play. Um, but in doing that, in doing that, in inspiring children, and we call it, we say inspire children to be the, the builders of tomorrow, uh, in doing that, we know that we have an impact on the planet. So we use about 70, 77,000 tons of plastic a year, and we make, uh, we make a million of these little guys every single day. Uh, so we know that there's a responsibility on us as a company uh, to address the fact that there's a million new people on the planet every single day. <laughs> Um, and whilst the product is durable, and we haven't really seen many examples of where the product no longer works. We saw one example in a, in a Swedish kindergarten, uh, which had had bricks for about 30 years, and they, they were starting to not fit together so well after the kids had hammered them every single day for, for 30 years. Alternatively, when they start chewing on them, that sort of <laughs> messes. Not advised, uh, not, not generally advised. Um, so, so, you know, we know we make a durable product, and, but what we've, done, what we've realized is that we can't continue to, to make this product with, with no uh, understanding of, of the future. And that's why uh, in 2015, we put 150 million US dollars behind a search for more sustainable plastics. So looking predominantly either at recycled material or bio-based material, so plant-based material. Um, but that's upscale, and I think that's what you were talking about. Upstream, that's what you were talking about. We also recognize that we have a responsibility downstream and trying to promote the use of the brick for as long as possible, for as many years as possible, before ultimately it can be recycled. Okay, so um, what I would like to know is, uh, well, there are lots of things I'd like to know, but um, for, could you just start with some, some definitions? Um, when you talk to a, a person in the street, they won't be able to tell the difference between degrading and breaking down, you know, falling apart. So what is, what is the most dangerous thing that happens to plastics that then, in, that, that then seeps through to the environment and, and has all these nefarious effects that we, uh, that we, uh, that we see today and that we want to, uh, that we want to stop? Um, I could take that. Well, I mean, before plastic even breaks down, if we're packaging all of our food and beverages in plastic, and if that plastic is made using chemicals, plasticizing chemicals, like bisphenols and phthalates, these have been identified as endocrine disruptors. So small micro amounts are leaching into our food and our drinks, and they're impacting our health. And those chemicals have been linked to lower sexual function, sterility, infertility, breast cancer, brain cancer, prostate cancer, obesity, and diabetes. And that's just studies that have been done that are related to adults. It also impacts children in utero, babies in utero as well. So, I mean, it's a problem, be sorry, it's a problem before 
we're even looking at how it breaks down or breaks apart in the environment. And it doesn't actually break down. I mean, I'm not a chemist, so maybe one of you guys could talk to it better, but I mean, it, it's not breaking down, it's breaking apart into smaller pieces. And right. what we're seeing now is that we, whereas seven or eight years ago, we talked about microplastics, we now know that there are microbeads, pre-consumer plastic nurdles, there's microfibers, there are, uh, all different kinds of, there's plastic breaking apart, so into microplastics. And we're basically creating this kind of plastic soup, which our oceans have become, not just this concept of islands. So what is wrong with that? What's wrong is that when plastic gets into the environment, particularly into the water, it's oleophilic and it attracts other persistent organic pollutants to the surface. So you can have a tiny pre-consumer plastic nurdle which basically has a million times the POPs attached to the surface, and it looks like a fish egg, and it's ingested by the marine chain that is potentially absorbing those chemicals into its body. And then many people in the world depend on seafood, or sea life, rather, depend on sea life for their protein source. So it's really, it's like plastic pollution is one of those issues that's very insidious, and it's coming back on all these different fronts to bite us in the butt, and we don't even... Many people are not even aware that that's happening yet. Well, it's also because of the fact that it comes also it's derived from oil. So the entire oil extraction business and all of the human beings along that chain that are negatively impacted and affected by it, as well as looking at folks on the other side of it when it's clogging up waterways, um, it's, it's getting into trees. So it's not only not looking great and actually creating really dirty environments, but it's actually preventing people from having access to water, yes. creates flooding, it creates all types of things. So there's so many different issues around plastic, the dead zones that it creates, you know, the birds that are falling from the sky because they're filled with plastic that they've eaten, so they're dying from toxicity and starvation. There's just many different chains upon which the plastic well, kind it, of and it also unfairly it also unfairly impacts people in lower income communities because oftentimes the industry solution to plastic is to incinerate it or waste to energy, and that is the least efficient thing that we can do with this material. It's a much more ma valuable material than that, and uh, and it really impacts people in lower income communities in that they're they are normally living more near to these incineration plants and then impacted by particulate pollution in the air and have higher levels of asthma, et cetera. So plastic pollution actually along the entire production chain of this material is an environmental justice issue. So Mark, you mentioned that you're involved in an initiative which basically tries yeah. to a certain extent to fish out some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we, we actually have the, the title of the, of the session is Reuse, Recycle, Redesign. I was thinking of adding another, which is Retrieve. Yes. Um, so 80% um, of all the plastic that we've produced has either ended up in landfills or, or in the ocean yeah. uh, since, you know, well, since the 1950s when, when it became widespread and since the graduate in 1967. Um, so, so what can we do? to try and get rid of some of this stuff, to take it out from the ecosystem. Yeah, so one of the things that we've been looking at is we had success creating a mobile service for fishermen to, to catch more fish. That, and the, to be clear, this is small-scale fishermen exclusively, not creating a, a, a killer app for commercial vessels. This is for two people on a boat with a line um, catching fish. One of the opportunities we feel is that plastics could be a secondary income stream for low-income communities. So if you look at the informal sector, whether they be sales agents on land or fishermen out in the sea, what you could do is create a second informal economy where they could collect trash and they could actually make an additional income. One of the discussions that we were having beforehand is there's no real magic that we can do to collect plastics. It's hard, and it's, and it's relatively thankless because you don't get paid a lot of money for it. That's why creating solutions that are dependent on the income stream from plastics are less likely to succeed, whereas if we could create something that's a secondary or even a tertiary income for someone, they could actually make that something that they could do on, on like a way back or a way out to see or on a, on a return trip from dropping off a product that they've sold in a community, they could collect and bring back um, and retrieve. So that, that type of a model could actually function um, quite broadly, actually. So who would, who would be doing the paying? 
And where would the plastic retrieved, thus retrieved, go? So there are plastic banks, there are waste banks, there are a series of different solutions. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you can really just strip away a lot of the branding, treat it like a commodity. It's harvested, it's processed, and it's sold. Period. And negotiating the economics of that is purely a financial discussion. And if you can, and if that type of a system could be formalized to the upstream, the informal downstream could function not dissimilar to the way consumer products are sold into remote areas. Right. So well, it's, it's just the reverse supply chain. It certainly has more value if totally. it's taken back right after use right. than if we have to retrieve it from the That's ocean. Right. That's right. Yeah. But I think, I think one of the fundamental challenges here is around education and value that you talked about as well, is that the material itself, and you can argue whether there are issues, but the material inherently, plastic, is a fantastic material. Yeah. It has advanced our society. It has changed the way we do business in, in the way we ship food, the way we deliver medical care, the way we transport people. It, it is our understanding and our uh, education around the, how the we way treat we, the, the way we play. The way we play, the way we play. And, and you know, I think and I, it, it's, it's easy for me to say here, and you know, people hold on to their Lego bricks and they pass them forward. But the reason they do that is because they have value to them, either economic or emotional value to the product. And I think we need to get people to, to reevaluate their relationship with plastic and reattach value to it. In the same way you value lots of the items that you have uh, in your home and you wouldn't dream of throwing them away after a single use. And so I think the material you know, is, is not necessarily the villain here. It is the way we as humans are interacting with that material. And you know, somebody has said it before, but plastic didn't get up and grow legs and walk into the ocean. You know, so that there is something that we need to think about as, yeah. as humans and society. So the, the, I remember an economist um, once explaining how you can tell waste from resource. This is, um, this is a, it's a very interesting distinction. So waste, a resource is something you pay someone to get. A waste is some, something you pay someone to take off you. So we need to turn plastic from the second, from the latter to the former. Wow. Um, now, I, uh, we, unfortunately, we don't have that much time left, but so we've, we sort of, we've mentioned um, sort of recycling, uh, re, uh, reusing, the need for reuse um, uh, and retrieval. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about refusing to use in the first place. Rosario, do you have um, um, something to say on that? I didn't realize how much time we had. I just want to throw out a few things. Um, one of the things that we did in California was working with multiple different organizations, including the grocers, to start uh, banning single-use plastic bags, to start actually looking at it. And then we took gang members who were going through reform like organizations to start designing reusable bags. We were taking note from, you know, folks that I know in Germany who were just like go to the market and start taking all their plastic off of the, at the store and leave it there so that they could transform the stores would have the impetus to have to do something about it. Um, so now California bans single-use plastic bags, but that happened city by city by city by city by city, really small until we could get something really big so that we could stop using them. Um, there's really great organizations like Seabin, there's a bunch of surfers in, in Australia who created it, where it's just a bucket that gathers plastic. Um, so people are trying to be really innovative, using it for insulation for housing, all types of things. There's a guy in um, Japan named Akinovo Ito, a blessed company that created a machine where you can take styrofoam, plastic bags, cups, all types of stuff, and boil it down and reduce it back to oil. Um, so that we could actually, so that, that gives an incentive for people to actually collect this plastic because you can actually bring it back to a very valuable commodity, which also then disturbs the cycle of us needing to keep extracting oil. Um, but I'll let you go to some of the other stuff that I know you wanted to talk about, but I just wanted to throw some of those really amazing innovations that are going out there. They're very expensive, still a lot of them right now, but um, there's, there's, there's people really trying to solve this problem, but a big part of it is just not using it at all. Right. So, yeah, so we had taken this idea of the three R's that they teach kids in the United States, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we added a fourth R onto the front, which is whenever possible, refuse single-use and disposable plastic. When you go out somewhere, hi, I'd like a lemonade, I'd like an iced tea, I'd like a margarita, no straw, please don't put any plastic in my drink. It's a very simple thing that you can do if you yeah, love don't straws. Yeah, don't suck, Don't suck. Yeah, don't no suck. Don't suck. Stop sucking. <laughs> yeah. And have your last plastic straw. 
Um, but so that's a very simple thing that you can kind of empower people with, and kids actually love that. Um, when we look at this idea of refusing, for me personally, it's just a challenge every day. You get up, I'm traveling, I look around, what else can I have something in? I've got my reusable cup, I've got a reusable bottle, I've got my bamboo utensils, and I have a, a steel straw that I use. And I feel like an urban backpacker, and it's cool. Like, I'm not creating any waste when I'm out and I'm in motion in my daily life. And I feel good about that. And I think that with clever design, and again, clever innovation, and we're seeing innovation where people are providing incentivized reasons for someone to bring a product back, packaging back, something that's made of steel or glass or wood or other materials other than plastic that you can refill, you pay a deposit on it, et cetera. Bring, if you stop at the same coffee place every day, bring your own reusable cup. Bring a mug from home if you don't want to spend any money and just show up with that. And I'm finding that there are a lot of companies that are coming along with incentivizing that and rewarding the consumer with this behavior change. But we need massive viral behavioral change. Or literally, we're all going to be living in idiocracy. Uh, we may already be. So, Mark, um, I was told we have a couple of more minutes since it is lunch, so we will keep you here um, to whet your appetites even more. Mark, I would like to, with your, with your Unilever hat on, um, you, how would, would a consumer goods company, a giant like Unilever, go about um, refusing, the, the ref refusal R? Um, you, know, you use a lot of plastic packaging in your, in your products. How do you get people to use less? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go to what Tim had mentioned and, and also um, to Diana. What actually just listening to you speak really, sp I mean, it spoke to me on a personal level because I do the same thing. Um, I think it's about pr appropriateness of use and then educating the consumer because I think to Tim's point, there are, just, there are practical and, and good uses for plastics. Um, I think there are unnecessary, like straws, for example. Stop sucking is actually something I personally do advocate for with that organization. Um, but I, I do think there's a big, a, a lot to be said for conditioning the public to appreciate non-plastic, um, a non-plastic consumable lifestyle. It's, um, it's a principle that feels very uh, wasteful, not just because you're actually creating more waste, but the logic and the mentality behind it of everything being disposable is, a, is something that I think um, needs to be changed. And I think your, your framing of, a, of an urban warrior with the metal straw and the reusable cup, I do the same thing walking around with a backpack. It's kind of cool. Urban, and, urban backpacker. Yeah, <laughs> and it's nice to be able to walk into a place with your reusable bottle and just fill it up. Um, so I, I think there's something to be said for um, yeah, behavior change with consumers. I think, though, there's a note of optimism here as well. Yeah. In that, you know, I get letters all the time from kids, and it's a, it's a great part of my job is to, to understand what children and, and young adults and parents are thinking about this subject. And I think they are so knowledgeable about the environment, about climate change, around plastic, around litter, around recycling. And I think that is something that has been happening for the last 15 years, but even more so now. And I think children are constantly writing to me saying, why don't you do... Uh, develop your product in this way or in that way. And we use that inspiration. You know, we're a very child-focused company. So I do think things are changing as well. I think that hopefully we are over that, that hump of not respecting the materials. And that's not just plastic, it's metal, glass, all kinds of materials. And that you know, there is a new generation of younger adults and children that are, that are leading the way. And, and yes, they have uh, an idealistic sense of the way the world should be, but we need to harness that more and build that more. And, it ultimately comes into the, the design of the product, getting it right on the one hand, and then the, the um, human connection with the product and how we treat it. And if you get those two things right, we're going to be in a good place. I think I this, is a, um, this is a wonderful place to end. Uh, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Um, it's a shame we can't really go on, but we, do, we will let you go to lunch now. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Rosario, Diane, Mark, Tim. Thank you. Um, thank you. I like how we and ended on Burning Man, kind of like backpacker, <laughs> <laughs> reuse, recycle, backpacker. Totally. Like, it is cool to be a burner, you know yeah, what I mean? It is. Like, it like, was. <laughs> totally so cool. Which way do we have to go? That way. Yes. Oh, yeah. We're going this way.